So now we come to the last segment, but not the last video, just the last segment so I can start to go back to the first 18 verses. This is the last segment. Oh, I hate this. Let me see if I can pull it down a little. This is the last segment of Matthew 24. Okay, all the way to the end of this verse. This total from 45 to the end of verse 51, um, as mapped by Anonomenon, <laughs> I can't say that very well. That section from verse 45 to the end of verse 51, he mapped it, parsed it at 217 syllables. Now, again, if you were listening to Christ, and he's obviously metering while he talks, if you were listening to Christ, you had memorized the Bible just like he did, okay? Everybody memorized and metered the scripture while they studied it. That was to, the metering was to, the purpose of it was to help you check that you had memorized it properly. It's a very prosaic meaning. Mary metered her Magnificat at 217 syllables and technically speaking that was the first scripture for the New Testament. All of Luke's gospel is patterned around the order of the meter in the Magnificat and I did the Luke videos in Vimeo you can go look at them proving how you can prove that the entire meter of the Magnificat was the basis for Luke's Gospel. I also in Vimeo you have GGS 11S which is the Magnificat. It's also in YouTube but the Vimeo videos are better to look at. They're clearer, they're easier, they're easier to play and they have their own channel. But here's the point. Christ of course is son of Mary and he's closing Matthew 24 on the same meter count for this paragraph as his own mother. He's relying on the people who heard him talk to know her meter. It's the only time that she talks that is counted as scripture at the time she talked. And we know that because Zechariah's who, you know, six months later is, you know, his tongue is finally loosened by God. And when his own son, John, who was going to be John the Baptist, got his breast. Okay. When Zechariah talks, Zechariah also talks in meter. I also covered that in the GGS 11S videos for the Magnificat. He patterns his meter on Mary's meter. And Mary's meter is what she speaks as soon as she gets off her donkey when Elizabeth is telling her she's pregnant. That was very famous very clearly at the time Christ spoke. Because he's using his own mother's meter. His mother's meter is all about how the first Hanukkah was going to produce her son who was going to be born just as predicted in Haggai 2, which she partly quotes while she's talking in the Magnificat. And she's metering. It's the same syllable count, 217 from verse 45 to verse 51 is the same syllable count as Mary used in Greek. And it's one of the most sophisticated meter passages I've seen in Scripture. The only thing more sophisticated than what Mary did in the Magnificat so far that I've seen um, is Daniel. The sophistication in Daniel is just, it's beyond a payout. It took me 30 pages to write it up. I mean, technically speaking, I suppose you could say Paul's meter in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is more sophisticated because it took me 150 pages to explain what Paul did. But in terms of what Daniel is doing and explaining, it took me 30 pages just to track the scripture he's quoting. Okay, and Mary, the issue with her is that her, the way she links up the numbers, 
in her 217, her dateline numbers, I don't know anybody more sophisticated than that anywhere in the Bible. This woman was uh, like totally a math genius with dates. Or the Holy Spirit, of course, is the math genius and he just talks through her at that time. Because any of us is a genius when the Holy Spirit's talking through us. And then, you know, when we sin again, of course, we're our same old stupid selves. And she called herself a sinner, so she happened to not be in a state of sin when she was talking to Magnificat. It's brilliant. And, of course, Christ wasn't sinning. He never sinned. So he is using Mary at 217 syllables. Now, the 217 syllables is 14 less than God used in replying to Daniel again, Daniel 9, when God replied to Daniel in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, God's reply to Daniel, and that's in the Daniel channel in Vimeo, God's reply to Daniel is 231 syllables. Mary knows that. Mary deducts the 14 because Israel was over budget still by 14 at the time she talks. Just like Daniel had done, remember he deducted the 14 here. Okay, here's Daniel 9. See how he's deducting the 14 here, which we already saw Christ use. Okay. Mary knew that, and she deducted the 14, because she doesn't know if time is going to play out. That's up to God. Okay, when she does the Magnificat, she takes out 14 syllables also, because it's up to God whether or not Christ lives out his full allotment of the 40 years and the full allotment of the 40 years you can just tell by knowing the numbers when you crunch the numbers in the Old Testament but it is also true that it turns out even the Talmud records that in Sanhedrin um, sections 97 through 99 especially 97 so Messiah was supposed to live 40 years but whether or not he actually lived that long Mary, Mary kind of leaves that as a cliffhanger and she deducts 14 years 7 for the tribulation and possible extra 7 for the Lord's own lifetime which of course that turned out to be true in her meter leaving it at 217 so when Christ himself is using 217 here to here that's yet another way for him to tell his listeners hi I'm not going to live to age 40 my mother had predicted it and you know it was still possible that I might live out to be age 40 but of course he'd already stayed in Matthew 16 18 to forecast church built on himself but that would only happen if he himself died seven years early and it would have to be seven years early because the deadline was a thousand years after David's death which was seven which would have given him his 40 years but see the temple would have had its own deadline in 30 AD when he actually dies a couple of months after he says this. So he's basically saying, hi, I know I'm going to die. you got to accept this. Of course, he's been telling them that since Matthew 16. And he's going to keep on repeating it in Matthew 25 and 26. Okay. So he's saying, you know, these are like my last words. You know, be the faithful and sensible slave. I'm your master. I'm putting you in charge of my household to give food to the, you know, other believers at the proper time. Meaning spiritual food, meaning Bible doctrine. Okay. Blessed is a slave who the master finds doing when he comes. Again, this is application to church. Are we doing the job we are sent to do? while we wait for our master to come pick us up again okay and if so this is play on the talent parable the seed parable I will put him in charge of all my possessions but if that slave says in his heart remember the slave with the, the napkin my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves fellow Christians and eat and drink with the drunkards and what does that mean all those disgusting lying pro-lifers especially the teachers who spit on Bible 
who reverse what the Bible says in order to make politics and gain power and gain your money, that's, if, that's effectively the same as eating and drinking with drunkards. Christians are drunk, drunk on politics now. We don't even get to choose for president except among vile, apostate, disgusting, spitting on God Christians like Ted Cruz and disgusting Donald Trump and disgusting Marco Rubio and disgusting John Kasich and disgusting Ben Carson, all of whom say they're pro-life, but they don't even know how to read the Bible. They're spitting on Christ and those are the only people we get to elect. Satan made sure of that. So they're beating us up and having us be drunk with drunkards, whether they're our political leaders or they're our teachers, like Coral Ridge and Patrick Robertson and Oral Roberts and even Hal Lindsey, who should know better. They spit on, spit on Christ. They spit on the Bible. And that's equivalent to beating the fellow slaves, because you know what? Most Christians don't know any better. They're depending on the teachers and the leaders. And the teachers and the leaders are beating us and eating and drinking with drunkards, asking for our money and political power, spitting on Christ, just like the Jews always did. You know, when it says a hundredfold in the seed parable, that means 99% of Christians are apostate. Well, turn around, turn on the TV today. That's all you see. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect. Yeah, because nobody believes in the rapture anymore. Dominionism is Ted Cruz's vile sect, and that's the majority evangelical position today, which spits on Christ and says, well, it's anti-Semitic, by the way. The Jews don't have a future. No, we're going to bring back Christ. Origin started that. The Catholics started that. Well, the Protestants are now just as vile and anti-Semitic as the Catholics ever have been. Yeah, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we're having a raging, a raging debate about this particular phrase. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, whether it solely means hell, or whether there's like a special nasty place for believers in the eternal state. And, you know, it's kind of hard to say that there will be, but you, certainly it's the bottom of society. This is what the people running for president right now, the people who are manning the citadels, the people who are in charge of the churches and the seminaries all over the United States. They're the ones who are the hypocrites. They're the ones spitting on Bible in order to get political power. This passage applies to them. Now, it's metered at 217 syllables. That's 14 shy of the judgment passage in Daniel 9, verses 9, 24 through 27. That's a judgment passage. And of course the second meaning of it that Mary had herself already outlined is that due to you know Hanukkah Hanukkah was a result of judgment. Hanukkah was God finally freeing you after God had judged you because you weren't being faithful to him and so the temple got destroyed. Remember, the theme is still the temple. And so Christ was born on Hanukkah because he's the temple the temple depicts. And she's going through the, her whole Magnificat. Is God delivers her on his promise. His promise of judgment and his promise of salvation. Okay, well, that's the same thing here. God is coming to judge you. Rapture is a judgment against church. Rapture is a judgment against the world because it kicks off the tribulation. And rapture, of course, is also a deliverance. Judgment and deliverance go hand in hand. So that's why Christ meters it to his mother's own 
meter in the Magnificat so that you will be reminded to look there. Hi, I'm the one that she talked about. You know the meter of her Magnificat, so now know the meter of your judgment to come. Take the message seriously. Who is the faithful and sensible slave who is master put in charge of his household? Now this is obviously directed mostly at the teachers, at the people who are in charge, politically and otherwise. To give them their food, spiritual food especially, at the proper time. In other words, each one of us, in a certain respect, we have a certain amount of spiritual food that we are in charge of. We are also being fed by somebody else. Are we eating properly? Are we feeding properly? Are we, to the extent that we have the charge of providing the food, are we doing that properly? And that applies to each one of us. Not all of us are teachers, but all of us are witnesses. Am I witnessing to you rightly? I hope so. You know, I pray to God, just kill me now or wake me up. I, You know, because if these people are so guilty that I just condemned, how guilty am I? Okay? Seriously. We're all guilty. You have to condemn somebody you know is wrong. But then you have to turn around and look at yourself and say, well, I must be to blame, too. So see how apt this is, especially when you look at the Magnificat and you compare the text in the Magnificat to what's here, a basic warning. That applies to church. It applies to Israel, too. But Christ is already basically saying, hi, I really am going to die seven years early. So that's why, I'm, that's why I, too, am truncating this at 217 rather than 231, which is in the meter in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Because I am going to die early. The 14 years will still have yet to play by the time I die. I'm dying at the beginning of the 62nd week, not at the end of it. That's why it's so important that he uses the 434 year. Because he's going to die at the beginning of that week. So there's seven years. It's 434, but that's only if he died on time. But he's not going to die on time. He's going to die seven years early. So that's why he's deducting the 14 here. See how important it is to know the meter and how much that helps you understand Matthew 24? Now, in the next increment, I'm going to have to, like, piece all this together because I still haven't covered the first 18 verses. And at the moment, I really don't know the answer. So I'm going to take off for a while.